Hello and welcome to Container Closure Requirements, preparing for USP Chapters 382, 661.1, and 661.2, presented by American Pharmaceutical Review and sponsored by Nelson Labs. My name is Mike Auerbach. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of American Pharmaceutical Review, and I'll be the moderator during today's event. In this webinar, you will learn about container closure requirements for parenteral products, what changes are brought with USP Chapters 661.1, 661.2, and 382, and Nelson Labs' capabilities to meet the new chapter requirements. In addition, this event will hold a live question and answer session at the end of the presentation. To ask a question, click on the Ask a Question tab on the right side of your screen. Please take note, the right side of your screen also features an overview of this webinar and more information regarding our speakers. If you have a technical question during the event, click the Test Your Connection button at the bottom of your screen. From there, you can access additional webinar support. Finally, we encourage you to use the social media widgets beneath the webinar to share with your friends and colleagues. And now, allow me to introduce today's speakers. Shiri Hector is an organic chemist. She received her master's degree in organic chemistry from Tel Aviv University in 2005. She began her career at Gibraltar Labs in 2006 as a chemistry group leader in the analytic chemistry department. After two years, she was promoted to the QA department as a quality assurance deputy with a focus on analytical chemistry. During her time in QA, Cherry completed certified quality auditor and certified Six Sigma Green Belt training with the American Society of Quality and currently holds both certifications. In 2017, Cherry moved back into operations as a senior lab operations manager. As a senior lab operations manager, Sherry oversees all analytical testing, routine validation, particulate testing, stability testing, molecular biology, and microbial project development, and fills the role as the main subject matter expert for analytical testing, giving support to the technical services teams. Currently, Sherry is part of the Global Pharma Segment team, supporting the pharma analytical testing at Nelson Labs' new Enhanced Pharmaceutical Center of Excellence in Itasca, Illinois, as a senior manager of scientific and technical services. Logan Luke graduated with a degree in microbiology and has five years of experience working at Nelson Labs. He has worked in the sterilization, ID, and packaging departments. Logan has extensive knowledge in the packaging section as he has aided many customers with their package testing needs from the bench top to troubleshooting and validation design. He is well versed in a broad spectrum of packaging tests from lot release, package testing for pharmaceutical products to full package validations, including shipping and distribution. Logan is also a member of the PDA. Sherry and Logan, welcome to the webinar. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, as was discussed, we will be discussing some uh, container closure requirements that are that are getting some new USP chapters. Um, the purpose of this webinar, uh, we'll be doing some high level overview of these methods um, and our discussion today will primarily be focused on parenteral products. So before we begin, we wanted to kind of lay the foundation and get some definitions uh, in place. Parenteral products, um, the term parenteral comes from uh, the word par, which means beyond, and enteral, which means intestine, so beyond the intestines. Uh, some parenteral drug products that you may be aware of are sterile drug solutions, emulsions, and suspensions. Uh, parenteral products are unique from any other type of pharmaceutical dosage forms for the following reasons, uh, in that they all must be sterile. Uh, additionally, this type of uh, administration is intramuscular, subcutaneous, which means under the skin, uh, intravenous in the veins, or intradermal. Uh, since we're talking about parenteral drug products today, we will not be discussing um, oral dosages, although some of what we're talking about does have application to them. We'll only be highlighting these parenteral drug products. So mapping out kind of these 
uh, types of parental drugs. The first one that is, I think, kind of most common that we think about are these injectable solution suspensions, uh, microparticle microspheres. Um, these you may be familiar with as uh, antibiotics, such as penicillin, uh, biological, such as vaccines, uh, and also a hormonal agent such as testosterone. Uh, beyond injectables, we also have things like infusion devices. Um, these are things like volumetric pumps, syringe pumps, enteral pumps, insulin pumps, elastomeric pumps, uh, and implantable pumps, uh, and patient-controlled analgesia pumps. Uh, and then finally, um, we have implants. Uh, these are used in treatment. Uh, some of the ways you might know them are treatments of brain tumors, uh, such as gliadel, uh, or prostate cancers, such as Lupron. So let's talk for a minute about what actual container closure requirements that there are for parental projects products. We're not going to be talking about the actual drug product itself, but what is the drug product housed in? Housed in uh, the container that it comes in, it has its own list of, of standards that it has to meet. Um, and some of these uh, kinds of containers you may be familiar with. Uh, I've got some on the screen here. Uh, IV bags, syringes, vials, auto injectors, um, not depicted on here are other containers such as blow fill seal or dental cartridges, right? Um, in the rest of the presentation, uh, we'll be using those terms. Um, and instead of IV bags, it's covered mostly as plastics. So keep an eye out for that. If ever it says plastics, um, it's most of the time intending on talking about IV bags. What does a container need to offer? is the first question that we want to tackle together. The very first thing that it needs to do is that it needs to offer sterility or protection to the drug product inside, right? Uh, I think we all understand that we want to keep microorganisms out of your drug product in order to make it so there's safe administration to the patient. There are some other contaminants though that aren't as obvious as microorganisms that your container needs to protect from though, right? Perhaps your drug product is oxygen sensitive, and so it needs to have a closure um, that keeps oxygen out so it doesn't react with your drug product such that when it's time to finally administer to the patient, um, the integrity of your drug product is maintained. Uh, compatibility is another big thing that your container needs to offer. Uh, the materials that you use need to be compatible with your drug product. There shouldn't be any toxicity or leaching from the container into the drug product that would make it unsafe for use. And finally, functionality of the container itself uh, is covered in some of these chapters that we're discussing today. If it's, a, if it's a container that needs to be accessed multiple times, is that elastomeric closure that's punctured by the needle, is it able to reseal itself is it able to maintain the integrity of that sterile barrier between uses? Uh, if your container is a syringe, does the plunger work as intended? Are you dispensing the appropriate amount? All of these are examples of how your, your container needs to be functional as well. I have up here just a, a brief list of some of the container closure related USPs. Uh, there are a lot of container closure related standards that I could list on here. Uh, we're only talking about USP today, but there are also plenty of ISO methods. Um, there are a lot of ISO methods which were foundational uh, to develop some of these USP methods even. As we go through the USP 382 changes, I'll have listed some of the ISO methods that informed the USP 382 methods in there. So going from top to bottom, uh, USP 381 and 382 both talk about elastomeric components. Uh, 381 covers more of uh, the injectables, whereas 382 is gonna be your functional tests. 660 covers glass, 
661 is covering plastics. Uh, and you, we have two new uh, chapters in point one and point two, where point one covers the plastic materials and point two covers the entire package system. And finally, we have USB 1207, which is giving guidance on your container closure integrity testing related to that sterility and protection of your drug product. So let's just dive right in, shall we? Let's begin with USP 382 and go over some of these updates. Uh, these updates will be live on December 1st, 2025. Uh, you are currently allowed to be an early adopter of this USP chapter. Uh, but please note that if you were compliant to 381 prior to this, uh, come that December 1st date on, uh, uh, yeah, tw December 1st, 2025, um, you will be required to meet these requirements uh, of 382 after that. Up here, I have a table doing a comparison of 381 and 382. So we have it split up by test type. So biological reactivity, physiochemical, functional tests, and then integrity tests. And you can see that USP 381 originally included about three functional tests, whereas 382 now includes seven functional tests, uh, as well as some guidance for integrity testing. When USP 382 goes live, on that December 1st date, uh, the functional chapters of 381 will be omitted and will we'll be required to just reference 382 for those functional tests. We'll be going over in depth some of the differences between these first three methods that are shared between 381 and 382, and then we'll be discussing what those uh, remaining four tests uh, entail. I do want to touch briefly on this added guidance for, for container closure. Uh, it points to USP 1207 as guidance. What I found interesting in my review of USP 387 was that prior to this, there wasn't really a specific sample size that was called out for integrity testing, and now it does provide a suggestion of 30. Uh, the acceptance criteria for those tests focuses heavily on the maximum allowable leakage limit. Uh, and so I would, we have plenty of uh, webinars out there discussing USP 1207. And I would refer you to some of those if you're looking to uh, investigate uh, how to be compliant with that. Uh, but let's move on to our very first test, which is the penetrability or penetration force test. On these first slides, I've included the entire procedure of these tests as they were contained in 381. And I did this to highlight the fact that these were very simple tests in USP 381. And in USP 382, they have been built out uh, considerably. The test itself though is uh, measuring the force required to pierce the elastomeric closure. Uh, and this confirms the ability for the, clo for the closure to actually remain in place also while you're piercing uh, that elastomeric closure. It's, uh, it's not stated as part of the acceptance criteria, but it does give guidance to check for the fact that if you go to pierce the vial, and the rubber stopper, if we're talking about vials, just plops straight out of your cap, uh, it's not gonna pass. It's not, it's not a, good, uh, a good seal on there if the uh, if force required to puncture it is pushing your, your septum out of, the, out of the cap. So what's new in 3D2 then? Uh, there have been a lot of methods added for multiple closure systems. This used to only apply to vials. Now you can see that it's suited for vials, bottles, blow fill seal, and plastics, such uh, like IV bags, like I mentioned, right? Uh, because there are so many methods, I'm not gonna be going through every single one, but I've highlighted some of the main points here. Uh, now it requires the use of a, a mechanical testing machine uh, and your acceptance criteria 
is going to be different based on whether you're testing a vial, bottle, blow fill seal, uh, or bag. So the, the sampling rate of your machine has to be at least 100 hertz, and your cross head speed has to be at least 200 millimeters per minute. Your acceptance criteria is the guidance that's given is meant for ease of access. So that could be different based on uh, what you're using. And it's up to you, you to determine what that ease of access number looks like. Next up, we have fragmentation. This is sometimes called coring. Uh, it's a measure of a system's tendency to fragment or core when it's punctured. Uh, if fragments are injected, it could pose a health risk to the patient. Uh, speaking generally, there has been much stronger emphasis on particulates in the, in the recent years. So I don't find it very surprising then that this method is conforming to particulate methods. Uh, even if we know that the fragments are non-toxic, we still are not sure what impact that might have on a patient if it were injected. So that's why we're so concerned of it. If you look at the original USB 381 method, uh, the acceptance criteria originally asks to uh, find fragments that were greater than 50 microns. Uh, and that was what was considered to be visible to the naked eye. Um, but if we go here to USB 382, well, one of the things that's different uh, is that bottom bullet there where the acceptance criteria is now counting for particles greater than or equal to 150 microns instead of that 50. Uh, additionally, there are m multiple methods for different closures like we talked about. And since there are now multiple closures that can be tested, your volume, your fill volume, as well as your volume that you're withdrawing uh, is adjustable as well. What is big here is that there's now the requirement to use particle-free water, which was not a requirement before. Uh, the number of punctures that you're using need to mimic your intended use rather than just having a prescribed number. Uh, and your rinsing and analysis is performed uh, according to this particulate method, uh, USB 788. Uh, just a quick note too, that 150 microns, that's measured based on the, the longest linear dimension. The final test that was shared with USB 381 is the self-sealing capacity test. And it used to be pretty easy where you take your vial, you puncture it 10 times, and then you do this dye immersion test with a methylene blue dye to check for blue dye in the, in the water inside. Uh, so now there are multiple uh, methods for the multiple closures, and they have uh, prescribed a sample size of 30 rather than 10. The piercings that you do is meant to mimic the intended use, right? Um, and this should mimic the most challenging uh, intended use that you have. Uh, what I found was interesting that is that the number of recommended piercings, uh, if for the methods that do have recommendations, uh, was also considerably less than the 10 that was in the original method. Uh, and instead of needing to do that methylene blue dye test now, uh, you can use any container closure test that you justify as suitable for testing container closure integrity. So some of these new tests then, uh, these are ones that you may be familiar with in some ISO methods, uh, but they're now new to USP. And the first one is the spike retention or sealability capacity. This is meant to test the closure system's ability to be penetrated by the spike once again, without pushing the closure into the container uh, and also block evidence of liquid product liquid leakage between the spike and the closure during the dosing period. So if you look, uh, it's a pretty simple method where you spike the product perpendicular to the closure. You put that closure end down and then the sample will just remain in that position for what's typically the intended dosage duration and then the sample is inspected for leakage. The next new test that we have to look at um, is break loose and extrusion forces. Uh, the break loose force is sometimes called the initiating force. And if you look at this graph here, that first peak that I have pointed out is called the break loose force. Um, this is followed by measuring the plunger extrusion force. Sometimes you can hear that force uh, called the sustaining force or the glide force. 
This is the force that's required to sustain the plunger um, to expel the contents of the syringe. Uh, ultimately, this test is demonstrating that uh, is demonstrating the ease of product delivery. And there can be quite a few things that impact that product delivery, right? Uh, such as fluid vis viscosity, density, surface tension. The thing that I always like to think of to kind of put this into context, and if I might share a little uh, personal anecdote, in a, in a previous life, I was a pole vaulter and I got injured. And I remember that I had to get a steroid injection. And if I hadn't had, if I hadn't seen the syringe beforehand, I would have told you that that syringe was filled with peanut butter because it felt so thick and it seemed so long to uh, expel the entire contents. So I think about that poor nurse having to administer that dose. And if the, if the break loose and extrusion forces were extremely high, um, that might cause some soreness. Um, I, uh, pretty frequently here in the lab, we also perform a test, uh, separate from these, which require aseptically filling some devices. Uh, and we can do that in many ways, but one of the ways that we do it is by utilizing some syringes. And I can attest to the fact, since I've done it myself, that when you have to do it multiple times, uh, if the glide force is extremely high, it can be extremely straining on, uh, on your hands. So I think about all those nurses uh, and doctors who have to uh, work with these syringes where the, perhaps the break loose and the extrusion forces are, are much higher and what impact that might have on them. Um, this break loose and extrusion force can also change over time, uh, making it more difficult to move by hand. If it's not by hand, but if it's uh, an auto injector that's uh, worked by, uh, by, by spring, the spring itself might not be able to overcome the resistance uh, and impact the plunger function. Uh, if you're looking at these graphs, you should be on the lookout for things that are highly irregular. This, in this case, it's a pretty smooth uh, slope all the way until the contents are expelled. But if you do notice something irregular, then you might uh, see that it's uh, due to uh, non-homogeneous lubrication and might be worth investig investigating. Because there's a lot that can impact these break loose and extrusion forces, the acceptance criteria is left for you once again to define and usability uh, needs to be the main consideration when you're uh, looking at your break loose and extrusion forces. I did wanna briefly show you a comparison of the top graph is going to be, we'll just call it a bad break loose glide force and the bottom is the one that we just looked at below, right? Uh, so what are some differences that we notice between these two graphs? Well, if the bottom's the good one, and it, ha and it goes all the way out to about nine millimeters, I'm looking at the x-axis there, which is how far the plunger is traveling. If you look at the top one, rather than about nine millimeters, it's only moved about five. Your y-axis is the force uh, needed to move the plunger down, right? So if you look at the, about the five millimeter point on the top graph, we've already hit nearly 30 newtons of force, which is much higher than our good graph down below. What happened when we investigated this was the reason that it didn't move past the five millimeters is because the needle actually got clogged. We were able to verify that the needle itself was, was clogged and that's why the method when it started experiencing these higher forces uh, aborted the test. So these are some of the things that you can look at uh, in order to investigate how well your brachial glide force is, is performing. Uh, we, we next have plunger seal integrity. This is intended to apply a consistent force to the syringe or plunger um, and then look for leakage. So in this case, you seal off the dispensing end and after you apply that force, you're looking for leakage past the plunger.
Uh, next, we have tip cap and needle shield. These tests are checking to see what the how much force is required to remove the, the needle shield or the cap. Uh, these syringes would, if we look at the examples down below, would be secured in our uh, tensile and compression machine. And then you would either apply axial or torsional force to remove the cap or the shield. Uh, the reason that we have these caps is to protect the needle as well as allow it to be sterilized while maintaining sterility of, of the contents, right? So next up, let's uh, talk about some of our USP updates for 661.1 and 0.2. These are brand new sub chapters uh, that are also going live the same date as uh, USP 382, which is December 1st, 2025. Keep harping on that over and over again and maybe we'll remember it by the time we're done here. Uh, and they've really recommended that there's going to be this three stage approach as you're assessing what materials to do and what kind of closure system you'll be utilizing. And so the very first one is a materials assessment and uh, that's gonna be covered in USB 661.1. And these are the raw materials themselves separate from being combined into whatever closure system you have. Uh, once you do come up with a closure system, assuming that the materials work well in 661.1, then you're actually testing the package system itself. Uh, and you're, the first thing that they recommend that you test is extractables, and then you're assessing the potential impact of those uh, of that extractable profile. Uh, and so USB 661.2, dealing with the entire container closure system, references USB uh, 1663 for that extractable testing. Uh, if that works, then the next thing they ask you to assess is the actual package product uh, for leachables, and they reference USB 1664. I have in front of me a few uh, tables just to touch on briefly. You can see that in the original USB 661, there were only a handful of plastics that were originally covered, and now there's been an addition of nearly double the plastics, right? Uh, so there's plenty more plastics to choose from, and there are uh, methods involved in each of them uh, describing how to test those individual plastics. Uh, if on the table to the right, you can see a quick comparison of USB 661.1 uh, and 0.2. Uh, there is some overlap, but USB 661.2 adds some more physiochemical tests as well as uh, those extractable leachable tests, as well as functionality tests if your product is, is light sensitive. Uh, it can be noted too that if for whatever reason you skip USB 661.1 and you meet the requirements of 661.2, you don't have to go back and do testing on the raw materials if you demonstrate that your uh, packaged system uh, meets all of the acceptance criteria in 661.2. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn the time over to Shiri to talk about some of these uh, tests included in these uh, in these chapters. Thank you, Logan, um, for the nice overview. Um, we're going to dive into the analytical um, testing um, that is detailed in chapters 661.1 and 661.2. And as um, Logan mentioned, the testing, um, the changes in the USP is actually um, to uh, promote patient safety, compatibility, and functionality. So the analytical testing that are presented in 661.1 and 661.2 will support that goal for the changes. Um, the chapter starts with identification tests. Um, identification tests are common tests for any raw materials, and this chapter um, 661.1 details the material for construction for the packaging system, which are the raw materials that are going to be used um, to construct the packaging. And the first test is FTIR. 
um, or infrared spectrophotometry. Um, and this is a common method that's used um, for identification. Um, standard and samples are compared um, for matching. And then uh, for plastic, we're going to use um, ATR, which is attenuated total reflectant. Um, thermal um, analysis is the second uh, test in the USP. Um, the thermal analysis used um, to determine a lot of the physical properties of the plastics. And it can be used by differential scanning, color, uh, colorimetry, or other suitable equipment. Um, all plastics except the cyclic olefins that are details in 661.1 um, require the thermal, thermal analysis test. However, um, in the USP details, there are only one test um, would be required um, as identification. So if one test, uh, if the IR test um, complies with the requirements of the chapter, there's no need um, to do the thermal analysis testing and vice versa. The second uh, type of test that are detailed in the USP would be the physical chemical tests. Um, and those tests are usually used to determine the physical and the chemical and the biological uh, properties of the materials. Um, so with this idea in mind, the test, um, we prepare the sample um, by extracting a specific quantity of the raw material or the plastics in water and we're exposing it to reflux. And then, um, the test want to determine if anything in the high exposure to um, heat extracted to the water and change the properties of the water. Um, absorbent test is the first test and it's really tested to see if the water extract absorbs any chemical during the reflex. And it is performed, uh, it's a it's this pretty simple absorbent test. Um, we measure the sample um, solution, the water extract absorbance between 220 nanometers and 340 nanometers, and it should meet the acceptance criteria. If the absorbance uh, uh, exceeding um, the acceptance criteria that detailed in the chapter, um, the chapter, it can be considered compliant. However, um, the cause for the high absorbance needs to be identified and quantified to see if it poses any risks um, to the end users, which are our patients. Um, the second test is acidity or alkalinity, and it's really um, to measure if there's any pH changes to the water extract after exposing it to reflux. Um, and then in this case, the sample solution can be titrated with um, either acid or base, um, and the color changes um, with two different indicators, and the color change will be um, monitored, and we're measuring really the volume uh, that it, um, the volume of titrant that we're using, either acid or base, um, to change the indicator color. Um, the last test for the physical chemical um, test that is detailed in the chapter would be the total organic carbon, and it also performed in the water extract. Um, the main idea is to see if any total um, organic carbon was added during the reflux um, to the water extract from the plastic. And in this case, measuring the TOC um, of the sample and the blank and um, calculating the difference. Similar to the absorbent test, in this case, um, if the TOC is higher than the specified requirement, the test, the testing, the material might be in compliance to the chapter if we can identify and quantify um, the cause of the high TOC and to make sure um, 
that it doesn't pose any risk to the end user. Uh, plastic additive would be the next uh, group of tests and plastic additives are plastic uh, are additive that are used into the plastic um, raw material during manufacturing or during the um, uh, procedure of manufacturing um, processes and then um, it, obviously some of the um, add additive that using for the plastic to make them more um, basically to optimize their um, qualities can be very um, toxic to the toxic to patient. That's why they need to be controlled. Um, the main group that will be tested are phenolic and non-phenolic antioxidants. Um, they're performed on a toluene extract and they performed uh, mainly by HPLC and TLC. Um, the procedure details multiple um, plastic additive test. Um, the test varies based on the plastic that we're using, uh, that we're testing the raw material and based on the requirement. The other test is related substances. Related substances um, performed by GC analysis. Um, example for this is residual solvents. Residual solvents are solvents that are added during manufacturing of the raw material and might be still present. And some of them can be toxic, toxic to um, the patient and there they need to be controlled. Another example for it is bisphenol A, um, which we all know based on the recent years that um, it is toxic and the present can uh, pose risk to users. And that's why um, also it needs to be, and it, it is common in plastics. Um, so that test was added to, to monitor and control um, the, the monitor and control the quantity of bisphenol A in uh, the plastic raw materials that are used. Um, 661.2 um, details, like Logan said, the packaging system as a whole, not just the material for construction. And the first test that is detailed there is the cytotoxicity test or the biological reactivity based on USB 87. And is really to measure whether um, there are any significant biological um, harmful extractable in the packaging material. In the in 661.2, the sample solution for the remaining test prepared by autoclaving the actual packaging systems. The actual packaging system, the vials, the syringe, or the IVs are filled with water to its nominal capacity and it's autoclaved at 121, usually for 30 minutes. However, um, the the exposure time is critical because some system will deteriorate at this temperature. And if a deterioration is observed, um, and it's usually observed by um, extremely um, extreme changes in the way the solution looks, if it changes colors or turbidity or, or any changes to the packaging itself during um, autoclaving, then um, it is allowed to use 100 degrees at a certain um, time. And if 100 degrees also is too high, then 70 degrees or 60 degrees uh, or 50 degrees at the specified time. And in the sample prep, we will need to prepare a blank and the blank will be prepared by heating uh, water in a glass or a silicate glass because it's inert. Um, and then sample and blanks are both compared during testing to see the differences between um, the blank, which is going to be water that assume that um, there's no there's no extractable or any material from the from the glass leach to it, and the sample prep, which is the actual packaging systems. 
Um, the first test will be appearance of solution, a color and clarity, and they're performed again on the autoplay samples. And the sample, um, the samples, the, the samples extract are observed um, against water and against the reference system for its clarity and color, and they should meet, they should be at least as as clear and um and colorless as water. Acidity, alkalinity, or total organic carbon. Uh, we touched that uh, those two tests before. They're similar tests as I described before, but they um, do specify. Um, in this case, we're using the autoclave sample. The next two tests are specific for polyethylene terephthalate and polyethylene terephthalate G because they uh, specifically measure um, the total uh, terephthalal moieties or ethylene glycol that are present during, that are specifically connected and can be um, a byproduct of um, PET and PETG. Packaging system and both techniques are using um, UV spectrophotometer. The first one, um, we're using different extraction media. It depends if it's a PET or PETG. The second one, we're using water extraction media. Next is the chemical uh, suitability assessment, um, extractable and leachable. And those are um, the guidance uh, is USP 1663 and 1664 for how to perform this testing. And then the last uh, test that are, is detailed in the chapter would be the functionality test, which is spectral transmission. Um, and it's performed by UV that has a specific adapter to measure plastic transmissions. Um, and uh, it's really determining by cutting the packaging system to a circular section and measuring directly with the in the region between 290 and 450 nanometers. Perfect. Thanks, uh, Shiri. So in closing, we just kind of wanted to throw together this final slide to help uh, you understand where the big things to look out for, right? The big things are there are new chapters, USB 382s. Uh, 661.1 and 661.2. Uh, 382 cover those functional tests for elastomeric components. Uh, and then USB 661 and 661.2 uh, covered those plastic materials in the entire packaging system um, with plastics. The go live date for all these chapters is December 1st, 2025. Uh, if you've met the criteria of USB 381 and 661, uh, once we cross that date, uh, you'll need to continue on uh, and be compliant with these new chapters. There were a lot of methods that didn't previously exist under the under those old chapters that are now included. So if you have plastics or closures that fall under some of those new chapters, look at them. Um, to see what you uh, might be required to comply to at this point. The, there are, in all of those methods, because there is a lot of variation, there's more attention that's needed for sample size and acceptance criteria. Uh, it's not always prescribed, and so there is guidance given for how to set that acceptance criteria, uh, and that should be considered when uh, trying to become compliant with these chapters. Additionally, there's that three-step approach that's uh, recommended when you're evaluating the plastic uh, container systems. And we touched briefly on that uh, following 661.1 and 661.2. And throughout all of this, we're happy to support you as you try to transition into compliance with these new chapters. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to either me or Shiri. And I think with that, we're going to turn the time back over to Mike for some Q&A. Thanks, Shiri and Logan, for your excellent presentation. I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit any questions you have for our presenters in the Q&A box on your screen, and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, we do have a few questions in, 
So let's uh, get into them. Um, our first question is, uh, what should we do with materials that are not part of the chapter 661.1, but are used for construction of the packaging system? Yes, um, so um, there's a lot of uh, materials that are details in use, P, plastics, uh, and those are the most common ones that are used for uh, construction of packaging. However, there might be cases when um, they're easy need to use some other um, materials that are not detailed in the USP. Um, the USP actually calls them unaddressed materials. They can be considered in compliance with the chapter if um, they can be well characterized and identified, and they can meet the specification of the chapter or um, appropriate methodology can be developed in order to determine similar tests as in the USP 661.1. Excellent. Thanks, Sherry. All right. Uh, we have another question in. Um, are there differences in testing requirements between parenteral doses and other doses? Yes, so both um, USP 661 and 661.2 um, detail um, different requirement between uh, the application, between the different dosage. So, uh, for instance, oral and topical doses uh, might not need um, extractable elements or plastic additives and biological reactivity. So yeah, there are differences, and um, but the chapter details um, the differences and the requirements. Excellent. Thanks again, Shiri. Just a reminder to everyone that you can submit any questions you have uh, for Shiri and Logan in the Q&A box on your screen. Let's move on to our next question. Uh, should USP be included as part of a stability program? Yeah, so one of the things that we had talked about was um, they even it's even discussed that for break loose glide force testing specifically, um, that the performance can change over time. So I would recommend uh, including USB 382 in some part, especially the functionality tests, um, as part of a stability program. Excellent. Thanks, Logan. Okay, well, I believe that's all of the questions we have uh, for now. Uh, we'd like to thank Shiri and Logan for sharing their knowledge with us and also offer a special thank you to Nelson Labs for sponsoring today's event. Please keep a lookout for an email containing a link to view this webinar on demand and to share with your colleagues. Thank you for attending the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>